Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Maker's Church. You guys can have a seat. My name is Mark, if we've never met before. Welcome everyone online. Hello. If you're going to be watching later, hello in the future. Future you guys. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm nervous. I haven't spoken in front of people in a sermon. It's been a year. It's been a full year. Totally uneventful year. Nothing happened at all. Super boring. No disruptions. No expectations that crashed and burned. Um, But let me pray for us before we dive in. God, I pray that you calm my nerves and that you speak your truth. Um, I have lots to say, and I hope it's only words that you have for me, God. I pray that I speak only words from you, and I believe you have a lot of words for us uh, as the church. And there's a lot of things I need to hear, things that we need to hear. And I pray whatever we feel, that ultimately we bring it to you, God, and that whatever is spoken today drives us closer to you. Maybe on our knees, (laughs) it may look a lot of different ways, God, but I pray that we are driven to you in this season and in this space this morning. And so, God, I pray that you are honored, that you are glorified, that you are magnified, that we sense your love and your greatness, and that that pulls us forward in the direction that you're calling us. And we do not forget the power you've given us as your children. It's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Welcome and happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend. And I'm sure uh, we're coming into the space with with a whole array and slew of emotions. Uh, If you're like me, I've I've felt every possible emotion you can this past year and this, you know, 2021, which has already felt like a year and we're like two weeks in. And so I just, again, I pray that we can bring that all to God here in this space. Wherever you're at, I pray that you sense his presence. And so we're continuing a series. We're in week three of a series called How to Get What You Really Want. The Paradoxical Way of Jesus. And that's a weird title. It's kind of provocative. Uh, It feels strange to talk about wants in a church sometimes. Maybe you were raised in a way or you you, you adhere to a a philosophy that says uh, desires are bad or wanting things is somehow inherently flawed or broken. And I think that's actually not true. I think God instilled within, within all of us these deep soul cravings and longings and desires. And the problem is not that we desire too much. It's usually we desire too little. And our vision is too low. And it's not really what we actually need. What we're seeking sometimes is what we feel like we want. But it's really something fleeting or inferior to the greater, deeper, core, soul longing of our soul that we need. And, and I think Jesus is always using these earthy, organic bodily metaphors. And I think food is a great example for this, right? How a lot of times we crave something. We think we want this. I think I want a Wendy's Baconator when really my body, my body is like, no, you need nutrients. You haven't had vitamins in weeks. You need vitamins and you need fiber and you need proteins and fats. Your body even needs fats, which is weird. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the show Alone on TV. It's like these people who go out into the woods and they have to survive with nothing. She at least likes this show. My wife likes this show. And one of the episodes, this guy is up in the middle of nowhere, Canada, and he's been out there for like 60 days, and he finally gets a moose. He takes down a moose, and he's got more calories than he knows what to do with. But the moose is too lean. There's no fat on the moose. And he's still, even though he's taking in like 5,000 calories a day of meat, his body is dying because it's not getting that which it really needs. And so often we as humans, we're, we're seeking after things that don't truly satisfy what we need. Wow. Or maybe we are seeking something that's good, but our strategy to get it is completely flawed. We, we, we are trying to take shortcuts or compromises to get to what we think we want or what we think is good. And, and we really are sacrificing so much along the way. We have broken methods and strategies that are sometimes even sinful to get that thing. And I think it's so interesting that really what this series is about is saying, first of all, we need to actually desire more and long for more and let God increase and expand what we see as potential for us and for this church. And then secondly, he's saying the way to get there is so different than what you've been taught. It's so counterintuitive. It's this thing called the paradox. 
You've probably heard us talk about what a paradox is. is it's this thing that sounds like it's two competing or conflicting ideas that seem to be opposite, but somehow when examined or lived out, it proves to be true. We know an oxymoron is actually a form of paradox. It's just a really simple statement. We've talked about these that makes it really, it's two things that seem contradictory. It's like something that's a genuine imitation. That doesn't make any sense. How can it be a genuine imitation? Or someone's passive aggressive. Like how can you be passive or hand aggressive? Or like a vegetarian meatball. Does it make any sense? You can't have those. Or like, uh, like a satisfying Chargers game. Like it's not a real thing. Right? Or like a good Nickelback concert. <laughs> These things just don't exist. They're oxymorons. But a paradox is taking that a step, step deeper beyond just a funny statement into a core truth. And Jesus is full of these. And the way of Jesus, the way of life that he speaks about so often is so counterintuitive because he's saying up is down. He's saying if you want to receive, you must first give. If you want to have life, you must die to yourself. If you want abundance, you must learn to let go. To have relationship, you must be able to, to love your neighbors and your enemies. So often, he's saying all these things. If you want to be exalted, as Derek spoke about last week, you must humble yourself. This is the way of Jesus, and it's scary, and it's difficult, and it's costly. But in the end, it is so much greater. Because we talk about sacrifice, but really, when we follow the way of Jesus, we're actually making investments. Because we're, we're planting seeds of goodness that will reap a harvest 10, 100, 1,000 fold. And make no sake, we're always sowing something. We're always putting something into the ground, some sort of seed. I love that passage. I used it last week on January 6th when so much chaos was happening in the capital. It says in Galatians that God is not mocked. Do not be deceived. Because every man and woman sows what they reap. It says if you sow to the flesh, you will reap destruction. But if you sow seeds... To satisfy the spirit, you will reap eternal life. So it says, therefore, do not weary in doing good, because in the proper time you will reap a harvest of life if you do not give up. But sometimes we're just throwing the wrong seeds in the ground, trying to get something we don't actually need, or we're using broken strategies to get it. And I want to apply this not just ourselves. I want to, this morning, talk about how this applies to us as the church. And the first story that came into my brain a few weeks ago when we were talking about this series is a story from the Old Testament, the very first book of the Bible. It's talking about these two brothers. You maybe heard of them, Jacob and Esau, these two twins. Esau came out just a hair before Jacob, so he was the eldest, and therefore he had the birthright to inherit the resources and the blessings of his father Isaac. And you see... As the story goes, there's a time where Esau was a man who was always out in the wilderness hunting, and he comes home one time, and he's been out in the woods for a long time, like the show alone. He comes home, and he comes to his brother who's cooking, and he says, Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came to him from the open country, famished. And he said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And it says in parentheses, This is why he was called Edom, which means red. Like his nickname came from like the food gate, which is so funny. It's like, you are what you eat, which clearly I would be Panchitas or Wendy's would be my nickname. But he's like, quick, give me that red stew. I'm, fa I'm famished. I'm dying. And then Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? He's a little bit exaggerating, but he's, he's hungry. He's thinking with his stomach. He's thinking with his urges. He's thinking about the immediacy of his need. But Jacob said again, swear to me first. So Esau swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and he drank, and then he got up and left. And it says, and so Esau despised his birthright. He despised his birthright because he was willing to sell it for a bowl of soup. And I wonder how often in our own lives there is something God is calling us towards, a purpose, 
a blessing, something that we are called to do, and we are so willing to sacrifice that birthright for a bowl of soup. And this looks so many different ways. And I do want to speak this morning of how I feel the church has done that in many ways. We have sacrificed our birthright to be light and salt in this world, to be the body of Christ, to be healers and peacemakers and bringers of gospel and love. We've sacrificed that sometimes for something that feels like it protects our privilege or our wealth or our status. We sacrifice the birthright for just a mere bowl of soup for political expediency that never is going to satisfy us. And we forfeit our ability to be the church that God desires us to be. And I want to qualify here when I say the church because I want to take a step back and say we have to remember that the church is big. The church is global. The church has been around for 2,000 plus years. The church is everywhere. The church is not predominantly in the U.S. The church is not predominantly white. It never has been. The church has always been from its inception incredibly diverse, incredibly and radically inclusive. You see, when the first early church began, one of the reasons that the Greco-Roman world looked down upon them It's because they had these little home communities where they would break bread and you had people from every single walk of life, every tongue, every tribe, every color of skin, eating together, rich and poor. And they they had women who were leading, which in the Roman eyes was so silly. Like, women can't even, they have no right to own property. They can't run a household. Why would you have a woman have any place in a church? And these things were offensive to the Greco-Romans. And they see, I don't want to forget that. I want to gloss over that the church has always been that. And the church has always, from its inception, been something, a beacon of hope that has brought life to this world. Even in our day and age now, so many of the things that we're so proud of, so much of the progress we've made in terms of equality and love and inclusivity has been because of the church and people in the church. The church didn't invent slavery. The church's slavery has been around for a long time. And it was many Christians who were at the forefront of getting that abolished. Those were the abolitionists. And we're celebrating Martin Luther King Day. We forget that Martin Luther King first was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a God-fearing, God-loving, Jesus-following pastor in the Christian church. I don't want to miss that. But at the same time, there are seasons When a prophetic word is needed to challenge us, to call us out, to expose sin and evil and wrong. Because a lot of times we need to be seen that so that we can confess and repent. And I'm speaking a lot of today, to be honest, I'm speaking specifically to the white American church. Partly because that's who I am and that's who I'm most qualified to speak to. And also who I think has the greatest blood on our hands in this season. And so this morning, I want to give some prophetic words, and I pray that we have the ears to hear them, and that God softens our heart, and that we don't harden it to what he has to say for us. And I don't want us as the church to sell our birthright to be the gospel in the world for something where we've given our allegiance to a party or to a a platform or to a country when God says, your allegiance is to me first and to my kingdom. And so we must call out sin when we see it. We must not equivocate on it. This passage has been in my head for months now. And I want to dive into this first and foremost. Matthew 23. This is Jesus practicing that prophetic voice. This whole chapter, 11 times, he says, Woe to you, you Pharisees, you teachers of the law, you religious leaders. Woe to you. And he lists out all these things that they are doing. They're choosing their own selfish desires. They're choosing their own privilege over what God is calling them to be. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint and dill and cumin. You're tithing, you're doing religious activity, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. The more important matters of the law. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guide, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. 
You're choosing to get angry about things that God is not prioritizing. But the things that God does prioritize, it says right here, these are the words of Jesus, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You're turning a blind eye. You're not hearing the cries of injustice and inequality and oppression and a white supremacy that is, is keeping others at bay. And you're not hearing those cries and you're not reacting. He says, woe to you, you hypocrites. You are misprioritizing the things of God oftentimes. And we need confession to name it, to call it out. And then we need repentance, which repentance, as we've talked about many times, is turning our, turning, changing our direction so that we can have revival. Because there is no reformation, there is no renewal, there is no restoration, there is no revival without repentance. And that's something Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The first step to entering his kingdom is repentance and we need to engage in that. And then he continues on. He says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and you decorate the graves of the righteous. You create holidays for them and you take work off on Monday for the prophets and the righteous. And then you say this, listen to this. If you, we, you say this, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would never have partaken in the shedding of blood of the prophets. How many times have we said that if we, if, we lived, if we lived in the 60s, we would never would have resisted the civil rights movement. If we had lived in the 1800s, we would, of course we would have been abolitionists. Name any point in history, of course we would have been on the side of God, the side of justice. We would, of course we would have been aligned with his kingdom. And he says to these people, no, you're not doing that now. You hypocrites. He says, so you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murder the prophets. And in his frustration and anger, he says, go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. And how can we too, oftentimes as the white American church, say we would have never participated in those evils and yet right now we justify and we equivocate, we make excuses for the sin around us. And I'm trying to make sure that we always have the lens. My lens is Jesus and scriptures. I'm not trying to let any political platform influence my view of Jesus. I want Jesus to inform how I see the world. And I think we should all seek to do the same. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. God, give me eyes to see what you see. There are millions of voices crying out in agony I at least must hear what they're saying and engage in that conversation. We never would have participated in that, is what they said. And we do this, again, with Martin Luther King, right? We, we, we either romanticize him, forget that he's, he was a man, or, 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 or we sanitize him. And we make his message so simple and palatable. We forget that he was a man of God and a prophet of his time. And a lot of what he said was and is controversial. It's challenging. It makes us wrestle. And we must say, is this, is this the way of God? And I just want to read a little quote here. I'm jumping all around, but this is good. It says this. This is challenging to me. This is from his letters from the Birmingham prison that I just reread again last night. And every time I read it, I'm so convicted. And this is just a portion where it says, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in its stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is merely the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. He would later say, you can have no peace without justice. We are called to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, and we can only be peacemakers when we realize that peace and justice are married and commingle and intertwined. Who constantly say, I agree with you in goal, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believe that they can set the timetable for another man's freedom, and who live by a mythical concept of time, constantly telling the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than the absolute misunderstanding of people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more 
is much more bewildering than outrage rejection. And then he goes on, I'll close with this from his quote. Some hold the strange, irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time itself that will inevitably cure all ills. But actually, time itself is neutral. And it can be used either destructively or constructively. You can either sow seeds for life or sow seeds for death. Sow seeds for the flesh or sow seeds for the spirit. He says, more and more I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than those of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. Human progress never rolls on wheels of inevitability. It comes through tireless efforts of men and women willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do what is right. And you know how Jesus concluded this chapter where he's calling out his own people? He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, church, church, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. I'm probably saying a lot that is making a lot of us uncomfortable. I know. On one hand, I don't want anyone to be uncomfortable. I don't like that. But on the other hand, I do think that God's truth, it reveals and it makes discomfort. But that should drive us towards Jesus. It should drive us to our knees and say, God, we need you. Do a work within me. And I want to continue on. I want to continue on here and then begin to close. And I want to talk about, I've got so many thoughts going through my head. There are so many things that have frustrated me and angered me and saddened me in this recent season. And I wrote a post a few months ago that I might read some of it. And it's it's because there are conflicting paths lay before us. Life isn't just binary, but at the same time, God is always laying these things out in scriptures. In the Old Testament, Moses laid before the people, he said, I present before you life and death, blessing and curses. Choose now, choose today what you will pursue. And then we see Jesus, the same thing, I present before you the way of life and the way of death. Choose life. Paul always says there is the way of the flesh and there is the way of the spirit. And as I already quoted, the way of the flesh where we see to our selfish desires, the things that seem expedient at the time, it leads to death, but the spirit leads to life. And in the same way, I feel that there are two gospels being presented to the American church right now. There is the way of Jesus, the paradoxical way, and there is the way of Trump. And I'm not even speaking so much about him because his power is waning and he is a man and his, we will be a footnote in history. But what frustrates me is that there are so many millions of people who through their actions and through their justifications show that they want a Messiah that looks more like Trump than they do like Jesus. Wow. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because you see in my post, I don't have time to read it all, I plotted it out. And I, I, again, I want to clarify that my allegiance is to God and God's kingdom. That is where my hope is. Jesus' kingdom is where we find freedom and forgiveness in life. It's not a political system. But, but, but Jesus doing a work in us will transform how we act and how we use our time and energy and how we vote. And we can't legislate a change of heart, but we can legislate justice for people. And we can legislate mercy. And at the same time, we must continually pray, God, do a work in me change my heart so that I can be about your business. And I lay out so many times, if you look at all these different things, all these paradoxes, you look at power. What does Jesus do? You know, I'm just going to read some of them. It'll be better. The way of the flesh. 
the way of Trump. It leverages, it amplifies, it exploits the worst in us, specifically fear and selfishness to its own advantage. Whereas Jesus tells us over and over not to be afraid for perfect love casts out all fear because God is love. The way of Trump uses power selfishly for personal gain and fame and at the expense of others. It takes what it wants, touches who it wants, where it wants, regardless of consent, claiming that power and fame give that right. But Jesus, who is the very source of power, emptied himself became a servant, became a lamb on a cross, and used his power and touch to heal, to uplift, to empower others. The way of the flesh takes, the way of Jesus gives. The way of the flesh, the way of Trump, is unabashedly and unrepentantly arrogant and prideful and cannot admit to fault. It must always deflect, defer, justify, or call anything a lie that contradicts it or reveals its sin or weakness. Jesus, who is powerfully humble, reminds us that it is through acknowledging truth, which is what confession is, that we can repent and find redemption and healing. The way of Trump sees the world as a zero-sum game where everyone is an enemy meant to be conquered rather than to be loved as Jesus commands. And in this way, the way of the flesh operates out of a scarcity model, not abundance, contrasting with the call of Jesus, who says, find your source and your abundance in me. I will give you more than enough. The way of the flesh is that of an unrepentant liar that actively tries to destroy trust in any form or truth in anything that contradicts itself. It seeks to be the sole arbiter of truth, which is blasphemy. Because there is one source of truth, and it is Jesus. Anyone who says, oh, anything that contradicts me is a lie, it's fake news, blasphemy. And it pushes us into dangerous, hateful, violent, unfounded conspiracy theories that seek to make itself a false god. The way of the flesh denounces things like supremacy or white supremacy, but do not truly condemn them and they wink at them and they defend them and they seek to perpetuate where Jesus was constantly calling us to share and to to see ourselves as equal children of God. And finally, the way of the flesh uses language and supports policies that demean, belittle, dehumanize, and divide rather than recognize that we were all sons and daughters made in the image of God. And for anyone who fears the loss of the church's influence from a political spectrum, I remind us that Jesus', Jesus promises his body, his church, can never be with, overcome from without, but it can be poisoned from within when we compromise the integrity of the way of Jesus from fear or comfort or worldly power. So we must be vigilant. I'm going to close with this story from the Gospels. And I was, my wife and I were talking yesterday, and I was working on this sermon last night in this room over here. And I was reading through this, and I was weeping. And it's, it's Jesus before Pilate, before he goes to the cross. In Luke 23, it says this. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people. And he said to them, you brought me this man, Jesus. I have examined him in your presence and I have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then I will release him. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man. Release to us Barabbas. And it says here, Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection. An insurrection in the city and for murder. Sometimes we wonder why was Barabbas even mentioned? He's not some random criminal. He was a word we've become too familiar with in the last couple weeks. He was an insurrectionist. You see, the people of Israel 
were occupied and they wanted to be liberated. That was, that was what they wanted in the immediate. That was the bowl of soup they were willing to sacrifice their birthright for. They wanted political freedom. They wanted to have the bonds ripped off of them. But God and Jesus was always talking about something so much bigger. He's saying what you really need and what deep down you really want is to have intimacy with the divine, to be set free from the bondage of sin, to be unshackled from all that is keeping you down so that you can experience forgiveness and release. And he's building a kingdom that would be global and would be unstoppable because it would be a kingdom of love and forgiveness and freedom filled with the Spirit. And there's Barabbas, who was the violent insurrectionist using political means of power. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and released. But with loud shouts, the crowd insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. And he released the man Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection. The one they had asked for. And he surrendered Jesus to their will. And I was weeping because I couldn't get out of my head the image of this scene of Pilate, the, the one in power, with Jesus there and this crowd. And I kept picturing the crowd with MAGA hats and Jesus saves banners. And Pilate saying, I, I lay before you life and death, the way of the spirit, the way of the flesh, the way of Jesus and the way of death the paradoxical way, this Jesus who came to be a lamb, a sacrificial lamb so that you could be set free. The one who came and he, as he was on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The one who came and he healed and he saw people. He says, I offered you this. And there is this. There is the way of violence. There is a way that you think you must take what will keep you in your positions, that will keep your fears at bay. I give you soup or your birthright. And the crowd says, give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. And I just couldn't get that image of how many people in our country today, once again, are saying, that's the kind of Messiah we want. Messiah who, who never backs down, who shows strength, who just bulldozes their way or the highway, no matter the cost. And then you have the way of Jesus. And as, I'm not talking as, as Americans, but as people who call themselves followers of Jesus, we must follow Jesus. It is the paradoxical way. It is the only pathway to get what we actually want, what we actually need. It is the only pathway to life. It is the only way that we can continue to be a part of his kingdom. And we are called to continue to build and to grow God's kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. As I've said many times before, so often we pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. And we, we pray it for other places and for other people. We see what seems to be chaos all around us. And we say, that is God, make your kingdom come over there in that person or in that place. But God is saying constantly, my kingdom of God is within you. And we should be praying, I should be praying, God, make your kingdom come in me first and then send me in your power to be someone who follows you. That's what Christian means. It meant to be a little Christ. And it was used as a slur when the church began. They used to be called just the followers of the way. It's very Mandalorian of that way. Do we want to be Trumpians or any other wordians, selfians? Do we want to be Christians? Who will we follow? Who will shape how we see the world and respond to it? 
who will shape how we use and give away power so that we can be peacemakers, which is our birthright. It says that. It says it in Matthew. Blessed are the peacemakers, for you will be called children of God. I've preached before, and I'll maybe do it again, how Paul talks so much about us being sons and daughters of God, but also adopted sons and daughters. And I love how in that Greco-Roman world, the father of the household was absolute in power. They could do whatever they wanted. They could divorce their wife. They could have their children, even their grown children, murdered if they wanted. It was, it was hardcore. It was not, not a fun place to be if you weren't, weren't the dad. The one bond the father could not break was an adopted child. They could never disown an adopted child. They could never dismiss them. And that adopted child, by definition, had the right to take on the business of the father. So when God says, I make you my adopted children, he's saying, I have adopted you so that you can be about my work. And you cannot have peace without justice as Martin Luther King declared, and we must use the means that we have to bring about justice and mercy and to call out and condemn the sin we see, the sins of racism and bigotry, any form of supremacy. In our country, it's white supremacy where we have people and structures that, that are not equal. We must call it out and do the work to change it. We have so much work to do. I don't have time to go into all this, but again, what it boils down to is will we sell our birthright to be the sons and daughters of God, called to bring about his kingdom and be peacemakers? Will we sacrifice that for just a fleeting taste of some soup, which will cost us our souls? What good is it to gain the world if you lose your soul in the process? That's all I got. I don't even give you. I've got nothing else to give. So, um, let me pray for us, and we're going to worship together. God, I pray that your word shakes us up today. It feels weird to give a message and a word that feels heavy and feels exposing. but I believe there is a time and a season for all things. Yeah. And I think we are in a season right now where the church in America needs a reformation. We are constantly in the process of being reformed, or we should be anyways. And I pray that the, the, the disruptions of these past 10, 11 months that have exposed so much and brought so much to light. May we not miss this opportunity. May we not just keep reliving the words of the prophets from Martin Luther King and all the way back that keep calling out the brokenness around us. May we not let the fear of losing what we are clinging to, to define us at the expense of losing what God's calling us to. I'm reminded of the words of the missionary Jim Elliot, who said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And we are no fools to give up, which doesn't even satisfy to gain that which is so much more abundant that we are called to. We need you, Jesus, to continue to correct us so that we can lament. God, I, I felt the way in the words of Isaiah that I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Sin is not isolated to any one person or place. God, we all feel it. It's why you said you came to take away the sin of the world. May we not make excuses for the abuses we see May we have the courage to bring it to light and to do justice and mercy and then somehow, somehow, somehow also leave space for forgiveness and healing. 
That is the most paradoxical, revolutionary, subversive thing of all. That you leave space for sinners to repent. And after repentance, after true repentance, there is forgiveness. You say you desire not the destruction of the wicked, but that they would turn from their ways. God, as you say in scriptures, may we have ears to hear your word to the churches. May we turn, may we repent, may we turn from our ways that are bringing about death in ourselves and in our communities around us. May we hear the cries rising up and may we respond. And in that process, may you continue to work in our hearts. Break our hearts for what break yours. Soften our hearts so that we can hear yours. Transform our hearts of stone into fleshy hearts fueled by your spirit. You're the only one who can do that, God. You're the only one who can do that. You are the only one with the power to change our hearts. But if we just hold so tightly, if we keep our hands clenched in fists and we say, give us Barabbas, we will never, never experience what you actually have for us. We will miss out on that birthright and we will fall into destruction and around us we will see destruction. And we say, how did this happen? How did this get that we shouldn't be surprised because those were the seeds we sowed. May we be people who sow seeds of spirit, seeds of life. So it says in Galatians, we will reap a harvest of life if we do not give up on following the difficult way of you, Jesus. The servant who has been lifted up so that you have power above all names. And so I pray this I pray this, that your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives first. And then send us, God, to be your kingdom, to be your healers, to be your confessors. In your name, God, we pray. Amen. Hey, it's me again. Thanks so much for tuning into Maker's Church. You just heard a sermon that I gave a few days ago, uh, from when I'm recording this anyways, and I felt compelled to do something that I don't normally, which is to record a short epilogue to the sermon, a sort of final chapter to help give us a little more clarity and, and create a fuller picture of the heart of the message, and to speak a little more about hope. But more on that in just a second. Um, as you saw in the sermon, what I focused on was a word of warning and challenge to follow in the tradition of the prophets, to provoke, to awaken, to stir us to listen and to think and to wrestle, and hopefully more than anything else, to pray and to grow. And this process is rarely comfortable, but it is in the discomfort that God often does some of his best work. First and foremost, we want you to know that no matter who you voted for or didn't vote for, you are deeply loved and respected here at Maker's Church. And in that way, the sermon was meant for all of us, me included, absolutely. Regardless of how we voted or didn't vote or what color our party logo is, for the weight of Jesus confounds and subverts and transcends all of our limited political ideologies, which we must always be able and willing to critique honestly, no matter what camp we're in. And the way of Jesus goes far beyond all that in the direction of love. For our deepest hope and allegiance must be found first and foremost in Christ and his kingdom. And everything else, including our politics, must be seen through that lens of Jesus and his gospel versus the other way around. And so because of that, it's important to me to clarify just a few things that I said. First, I want everyone to know that everything I shared came from a deep place of genuine respect. We believe that truth should always come wrapped in grace and be preceded, succeeded, and fully seasoned with love. And my intent was never to make anyone feel judged or condemned. So if anyone felt that way, I'm truly sorry. 
We believe here in our bones that Maker's Church is to be a place where all belong. That's a given for us. But again, my intent was to challenge in a pastoral way because just as Jesus loves us exactly where, as we are, he loves us so much to not leave us that way. And so we too want to be a place where we can grow together in maturity and more and more in line with the spirit and the gospel. We want to be a place where we can wrestle with each other in love, not against each other. And this is one of the most difficult paradoxes to do well. And the world says it's not even possible, but we believe deeply that it is the way of Jesus. And so all that being said, and please hear this, the sermon was always meant to be so much bigger than just politics, e even bigger than this cultural moment. It was really about our values and our vision and the types of seeds that we're sowing as people and as a church and about the choices we face daily, whether or not to follow our flesh or the living Jesus of scriptures and to abide in his love. For there are always opportunities for all of us to misprioritize, to compromise, to intentionally or unintentionally choose our own self-interest, which might seem expedient at the time, over what is actually better in the long run. We do this in our relationships, our families, our life goals, our jobs, our politics, our faith, and even sometimes in our churches. We often choose the bowl of soup over the birthright. And as I spoke on Sunday, we're tempted in various ways to follow these different false gospels and false gods that are made in our image and not the other way around. And this isn't necessarily a left or right or middle thing. It's a human thing. Some seek to build the kingdom without Jesus as their king, where the kingdom shares some of the values of Jesus, but see him as superfluous or unnecessary or even unhelpful and not recognizing him as a source of those noble ideas they may hold. And they tend to judge Jesus and scriptures through their own worldview and political philosophy versus the other way around and seek the destruction of their enemies and not their repentance. And this way cannot bring lasting change. Or even more dangerously, which is what I focus mostly on Sunday, there are those who claim Jesus as their king but deny him with their words and actions. And many in this camp compromise or sacrifice far too much thinking that good ends justify evil means when they do not. Their version of Jesus has been co-opted by some blend of self-interest or nationalism or economic policy that protects traditions, wealth, and privilege more than the people that we are called to love and neglect the weightier matters of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. This false gospel is ultimately driven by fear and scarcity and self-preservation. And this fatalistic worldview that ignores the words of Paul and Jesus that our fight is not against flesh and blood. The scriptures say we will know people by their fruit. And the violence we saw on January 6th is the fruit of this false gospel. And so there are these and many, many other ways that can be tempting. And we want to follow those, but the Holy Spirit's leading us to sow better seeds. I mean, you see, even Jesus himself was presented with a similar choice when he was tempted in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting. Satan came to him and offered him power and prestige and immediate gratification if he would take the seemingly easy way out and just submit to the devil, to choose self over cross. Jesus was offered a bowl of soup if he would just sell his birthright, but we know he chose a better way. So to sum it up, while on Sunday I focused on a prophetic voice of warning, here right now I do want to quickly speak about the profound truth of hope for our church and for the world. Because hope is an essential part of the gospel. It will remain forever alongside faith and love. It's not just a buzzword or, or a catchy Instagram post. It is a centerpiece to God's kingdom. Because he is in the process of redeeming all things and making all things new, starting with us. And because we have this hope, we are committed to working towards real unity, which is also essential. What's, what's fascinating, though, is that while Jesus came to make peace and even prays in John 17 that when we are united as one, that's how the world will know we're his followers, he also says in the gospel that he also came to bring division. So how can this paradox be true, peace and division? To me, the answer is he came to disrupt and dismantle false unity and phantom peace that are not centered around anything real. Because to have true unity, we need to unify around something solid. 
So let that be our commitment to seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. Let's unify around the gospel and around receiving and giving grace and our command to love. Let's unify around honest confession and repentance, all of us, and to give and to receive forgiveness and to step forward in faith, abiding in God's love. And then we can experience revival and then we can be people of resurrection power and our light will shine forth like the dawn and our Father in heaven will be glorified. Because God loves us more than we could ever imagine. And he is doing a work in the world to bring those far near. It's a beautiful reality that we are invited into. And I want to be a part of that and unified together in that endeavor. And so I humbly pray for myself and for us and for us as a church that God be glorified through us, through the way we choose to seek and pursue justice and love together. And may God's joy be our strength. And may we be people of life and love. And may God's kingdom come and his will be done in our lives first. And then through us in the world around us. We love you all. Be well. Take care. Like we said like we said, like I said before, um, there's lots to talk about, and there's lots of feelings, and there's lots of emotions that are going to come from this conversation. And so I just want to remind us that the goal of this um, is to wrestle with issues, to wrestle with questions, um, not so much with each other. And so um, I'll keep saying it. Um, this, is, this is a family, and family's messy. Um, this is a family where everyone's welcome. Um, what we're trying to do, and if you're not seeing it clearly, is we're trying to elevate a conversation above national issues to, to kingdom issues. All the while, like Mark said this morning, when we, when we elevate, when we can get ourselves to kingdom issues, it will trickle down into real life day-to-day -day issues. And so we can't look over or gloss over the things that are going on in our country, but we're trying to elevate above it and see over it so that we can see our way through it. And, and that's a tricky, tricky thing to do. And so many of you might be feeling certain things, um, and we just don't want to focus that at each other. And so if you felt attacked, and we know some of you did, um, that was not the heart, that was not the purpose, that was not the aim, is to make any one person feel attacked. Um, but we should all feel confronted, all of us, regardless of how you voted. Because that's what the words of Jesus do, is they confront and they convict. And they call us up to something greater. And if you didn't feel convicted or confronted, um, then you probably weren't listening. Um, and so we should all feel revealed, in a, like, naked. I don't know about you, but I do. I feel exposed. Um, and that should be true of all of us, regardless. No one's off the hook, regardless of how you voted or whatever. And if you, if you feel off the hook, go back and listen to last week's message. <laughs> right? Because you might be finding yourself going, I'm good. At least I'm not like. <laughs> so that's the whole goal of this time together. Um, Pastor Mark. Shalise and I stand with you in what you talked about, what you shared. I feel like you called us up and over the, the issues that are at hand. Um, and so we're just here in, as a united front to say, like, as a church, what Pastor Mark preached about this morning um, convicts all of us. Um, and, it, it, and, and, and we can't overlook the, the national things that are going on. There, there are things at hand. And that's probably where most of our questions are going to come from this morning. And that's okay, because we could talk ethereal, and we could talk ideologically, we could talk philosophically and theologically all day. But at the end of the day, we have to figure out, how do we live this out? How do we move this into practice? And what does that look like for us? Um, and so we're going to just open it up for questions. If you're online with us, thanks for sticking around. Feel free to uh, write your questions in. Um, but we're going to, uh, this is going to be orderly. Um, <laughs> So we're going to raise a hand, call in a hand, let, let, let somebody talk. 
And then um, if you if you have to get it eek in, just write it down, um, and then we'll we'll kind of go that way. So um, first first yeah, go ahead. I mean, I mean, I say amen and echo everything Derek just said. And uh, we say all the time here, we want to be a place where everyone feels. I said this in my writing, but I didn't, you know, when you give a sermon, sometimes you're flooded with emotion and you're running low on time and I didn't get to everything I wanted to say. But I had it in there. No matter who you voted for, like you are loved. You belong. And I put it in there too. And maybe I said it, I don't even <laughs> remember half of um, we must be able to critique any party or any politician through the light of the gospel. And, and believe it or not, as I was going to share, like, uh, I'm a non, I'm not affiliated with the party, believe it or not. I've been a nonpartisan voter since I was 18. I vote, you know, that's to boil it down. I want the kingdom in Jesus to influence how we live and think and operate and like Derek said, we all, sh I am challenged all the time. I am confronted with my own hypocrisy and my own irrationality and sin all the time. And anyways, just know it's done with love and a desire for us to wrestle together. Like Derek said, not with each other, but together. What does it mean to follow Jesus? There's a reason Jesus said, count the cost. There's a reason Jesus was crucified. His way is not easy. Um, that's it. Time for questions. <laughs> yeah. I'm not turning my back to you guys. It's 9,000 degrees in the sun. I want to. You have questions over here. You might have to raise a hand because it's blinding here. I want to say. I want to say w just one more thing about because I know it's going to get political and that's totally okay. We have to figure out what does that mean for us. How do we live this out? Um, what I heard Mark say this morning is that is there's a if you voted for Trump that does not make you a Trump a Trumpism or a Trumpian. That's what was being challenged this morning. A Trumpian where we've elevated anyone. You could be a Bidian. You could be a, yeah. a, a, that's the issue. It's just the, un, unfortunately, the b best glaring example we've had in the last yeah. couple of years and in the last few months has been Trumpism. And so that's what's, that's, a, that's you being used as a clear example, served up on a platter. Right. So if you voted for Trump, we're not condemning you if you voted for Trump. And if you voted for Biden, we certainly could condemn you for being a Bidenian. Right. So that that's the thing I want to be clear this morning. There are many friends on the left who, who think that this new um, this new administration is our, is going to be our savior and save us from all this stuff. It won't. OK, so just, I just want to kind of set the table there. So first question. Anyone over here? Nancy. I have been for quite a while a Michigan, and I like her list. Mm -hmm. I would like to see us find ways to get past that, to be positive influences, and to help it change. Mm. That's great. So for those of you joining online, and somebody did say, could we, give, could we pass the mic to the folks online? We're not going to do that because of COVID, but we'll, we'll repeat the question. Um, so Nancy Dilry said that in the last several months or years, she's been convicted by her own white privilege and feels like we as the church should respond in some formal and, and official way. Am I saying this right, Nancy? And you're wondering, do we have any ideas about what we're going to do um, as a church about that. And I think you bring up such a great um, need, right? And, and so we've been talking about this uh, for a long time. Before, before George Floyd, before all of the racial unrest in our country, we've been talking about racial reconciliation, ra racial healing as a church. And we've put practical steps in, in play that are far from enough, but inching forward. And so what we did this year... Um, in, in 2020, is we put together a racial healing roundtable where we invited more non-white folks, mostly our black brothers and sisters, to, to a table where we met every two weeks for several, several months, um, trying to understand our place and our role as a church and, and how we can best respond and what are the needs 
um, that we can do as a church. And there was a lot of ideas that came from that. Um, and the interesting thing is, is many of the things weren't really around white privilege per se. They were, they were really just aimed at us helping to be just a better church in general. Um, and if we could just be like, like one of the things was let's see each other and let's know each other. And let's, let's have a place where everybody's known. Even though we've always aimed to do that as a church, doing that is actually really challenging. And so what we've taken from that is building a new model, working on a new model to do more stuff like this. And we're working on a model for our future that will allow us to see each other and know each other in smaller contexts um, so that we can actually begin to learn from each other. Now, there's a bunch of other things that came up. Like, we know it's not... It's not the silver bullet by any stretch. But we know that our church, from the maker's church perspective, became more diverse than it ever was through the church merge. And we, th- we see that as a gift from God. Uh, we see that as, as God um, orchestrating something um, that was a gift to us. But we have to do something with that gift. And we have to begin reflecting that. And we have made steps in our leadership structure, in our elders, in our board. Uh, we're more diverse than we've ever been. But if you look at the front, of the stage, you know, the three pastors, uh, we're all white. And so we know that our next steps are to become more diverse as a decision-making leadership team. And we're aimed to do that. Um, and we don't exactly know the steps there. One of the ideas um, is when we, when we shift our model, um, our structure, our staff, and all that will change. And we know that when we identify vacancies that, that we need to fill, that we'll be very um, intentional about filling those positions uh, with diverse people. Um, Mark and Shalise, any more thoughts around that? I mean, there's, there's a long list um, of stuff that we know that we need to do, some stuff that we're currently up to, but you guys can fill Yeah, in. I mean, you, you covered the vast majority of it. It's, it's a work in progress for sure. And I think we're trying to be really humble, uh, but still being active in, in moving that forward. Um, like Derek said, a lot of it is going to be, as we restructure, how do we ensure um, that we are reflecting the gospel value of of diversity? And so that, like you said, in f- the way we structure our decision making, the way we structure the content we create, the sermons we produce, um, it, it, it touches everything. And so... Um, I think, but again, with the white privilege specific piece, it's, it's, that's that wrestling of, um, for most, I mean, that was nothing I was aware of. And that's, that's the privilege, right? I didn't, I didn't know about it. And as you begin to see that it's, it's proactively choosing ways to ensure that there is a, isn't a disparity in that, um, belonging or the decision-making and so, yes, we've been in this process of having our blind spots called out and trying to humbly be obedient as God leads us into places where we can do everything Derek's talking about. Um, and it's a journey. It's a process. We're in the middle of it. Well, and a couple other things just real quick on, on white privilege specifically, because I feel like I kind of, it went this way. But white privilege specifically, the whole pastoral team and many other leaders at, at our church went through a training with an organization called Be the Bridge um, over the summer. Um, that's just specifically to educate white folks about their own privilege. And, and, and that was a really important thing for us to do. We all read several books, different books by, by different folks, um, and trying to do our best to understand it. The next step for us to do is to figure out how to church-wide create space for those conversations. And, and some of the ideas are Be the Bridge has great curriculum and groups um, for, for, um, for white fo- They really are aimed at helping white folks listen and learn and hear from other people of color. And, um, and so that's just a, it's a, uh, through COVID, it's an organizational challenge. You know, how do we find, and, and a big part of, uh, of the struggle this year was, you know, our black brothers and sisters specifically are caring so much. And so there's the, the, the tension of not asking too much. And we did, we asked a lot of our black brothers and sisters this, this year as they said yes to our racial healing roundtable. And so we do have a, a plan to, in the future, bring about some, whether it's Be the Bridge or some other formal place for folks who do say, hey, I don't know enough about my white privilege, but I want to learn about it. Um, how can we set the table for that and create space? So that is, it's, it's on the front of our, of our 
agenda. One, one super quick last thought too on that, which this might be obvious, and hopefully it's helpful. When you look at history, like there's every single culture has always had a system where peop some people are more privileged than others, some have more power, um, and that's looked different. In our country, it has been white privilege. I, I call that out because um, there isn't something I don't think sinful, inherently evil with, um, it, it's, it's that, that's just happened, the, the expression in our country. And so we're just giving it a name that is relevant to our situation. So we're going to come to Becky in a minute. I want to honor our folks online from home who are asking questions. So we'll kind of go back and forth uh, in person and online. Um, you had a question too, right? Let me let me get these real quick. So there's a good question here from. Sorry if I'm skipping over you. Um, uh, let's see. Michaela Ortega said, "How do you respond to someone who thinks that politics should be left out of Sunday, or people who were uncomfortable and slightly upset after today's sermon?" I I mean I could take a quick stab at it. And you, so the, so the discomfort piece. Um, discomfort was kind of the point to a degree and I think I might have even said it like I if you know me I hate making people feel uncomfortable like it just goes against every bone in my body I want everyone to feel just valued and seen and, and, and comfortable and safe and everything um, but like I said it, something like 30 percent of the Bible is prophecy where they're just making you feel so uncomfortable from the old to the new to the I told, the whole Matthew 23 chapter is just calling people out and calling them up to be more. And if you've never been uncomfortable in your walk with Jesus, we're doing something wrong. Yeah. We're not following Jesus. Jesus is the one who says, come to me out on the water. Go through Samaria. Go to those places you don't want to go. Love your enemy. If loving your enemy doesn't make you uncomfortable, we're not doing it right. We're not doing it at all. So the discomfort piece, for the politics piece, it's tough. And it, we ha Here's the thing. So much of what Jesus talks about, I, I know this was in my notes, but I didn't say it. He talks about the here and now and how we treat one another, how we interact with one another, our love for our neighbor. And whether we like it or not, the reality of our world is that does spill into the political sphere. Mm -hmm. And like I was trying to hammer home, the thing we must always keep at the forefront is we can't yet our, let our politics, we can't let any person, not, I'm not talking about Trump, any politician mm -hmm. from any side, you can't let them be what's dictating your view most. It is from the way of Jesus. So what that means is, following in the step, footsteps of Martin Luther King, if I'm a Christian and I believe Jesus, who says in Matthew 23, the way to your matters of the law are justice and mercy, and you can look through all the Old Testament what justice means. There's tons of passages on it. If there is an unjust law, whether it's un unintentional or intentional, and it is causing someone else harm, it is degrading them as a child of God, we have an obligation, I believe, to use our political voice to correct that injustice. Mm -hmm. that, that it falls into the realm of politics. But again, my allegiance, as I said, is not to a party, it never has been, or to a politician, it's to Jesus. And I must look at the situation and do the best I can. And we're all gonna be accountable to God in our own ways. I guarantee I've messed up so many times in what I've said or what I've done or how I voted. But that's each of our burdens to bear and say, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't have to say it. I, pray humbly on my knees before I vote and say, God, for whatever reason, I'm born in a time and in a country where I have a vote. Um, it's a gift. I want to use it well, and I want to use it in a way that honors your kingdom. And I think that is what we're called to do. First and foremost, kingdom of God allegiance, but using our American rights. So, so to, to wrap it up, when it comes to a sermon, I felt so compelled. And again, I, I even said, I'm not even talking about that person. I'm saying the, the, the mindset that that person, because that person is going to be gone. Any politician will be gone. Yeah. But there is a lingering way in our country right now. Yeah. And it's not, there are good people, I, I believe, who, 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 are, who are selling the birthright for the bowl of soup. But there is a way in our, in our country that, is, that is, is not 
coherent with the gospel of Jesus. And I just want to call myself and us to that because otherwise we're going to keep on saying and doing the same things over and over and over again. Yeah. And you see the words of Mar why are the words of Martin Luther King written in, in 1960, whatever it was, four or five? Why is it so, re it's like you wrote it yesterday in 2021. Frustrates me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Real quick reminder mention, is this thing on? Um, we'll, keep, we'll keep saying this every week. Did I grab the wrong one? Um, <laughs> check, check, check. Oh, I hate myself. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure our online folks can hear us. Um, check, check, check. Grab another one. Which one? Check, check, check. All right. Um, Oh, I got some reverb. <laughs> Make me sound good. Um, one thing that I think we have to keep mentioning and addressing, um, I think we'll come back to it. I, I cause I'll keep talking. Um, yeah, Shalise, and then Becky. You know, as a, um, as a high school teacher, I get Michaela, that was a great question. I was really challenged last week, you know, when all this stuff was happening at the Capitol. And then the next day I'm supposed to be Zooming live with my students and like, don't talk about it, you know? And you're like, oh, how do you do that? And I grew up in church and there were so many things that you don't talk about, right? That are very taboo. And what I love about the passage in Genesis, you know, Mark was talking about Jacob and Esau, but even in the very beginning, you know, it talks about Adam and Eve and it says that they were naked and felt no shame. And I think there's so many things, be it politics, be it, you know, all those controversial, hard issues that um, we oftentimes have erred on the side of caution of let's just not talk about it and just hope that we all, like, get it right. <laughs> you know, or let's just all not talk about the thing and just hope and pray that everybody does the right thing or votes the right way or um, lives the correct path. And I, I think as, as a teacher, as a pastor, I feel incredibly convicted um, not to push my own agenda, but to create spaces where we can have these conversations. And I think that's what Mark was doing today. You know, Mark wasn't getting up and saying, here's the five ways to vote and do this. You know, he was saying, here's what I've been wrestling with and here are the questions that I'm confronting and where I think God is like taking us. Um, and that takes a lot of boldness and a lot of courage to step into those cultural moments um, because we're often told not to talk about that thing. Um, and so I just... I want to say that I think that we have gone wrong by believing that there are certain topics that have no place in church um, or things that are, you know, too t tough to talk about. Um, and I'm proud of us for stepping into it as a community. It's not, you know, uh, yeah, Mark today happened to be the person on the stage, but uh, how many conversations have we all had in community groups on the stage in our friendships during the merger? Oh, my gosh. You know, like the conversations that we were having to have for the first time. Um, and it would have been really easy to just not talk about it. And so I'm so glad that we are. Um, and I think there are ways that we can talk about everything without shame and bring it all out and expose ourselves and put it all out on the table um, and do that in a really healthy and productive way. And so I'm glad that we're choosing to do that. Thank you, Shalise. I 100% agree. Real quick on that note, we're all talking about it somewhere. And, and, if, and if, the church, if the church isn't a place where we can, and I, I, I should have done a better job saying this, that it's first and foremost a place with mutual love and respect where we can have these honest, conversa honest conversations. If not here, then where? Yeah. If, if, if we're not the place where the gospel is supposed to be preached, if that is not informing where we're, then where? Because it's happening. And what's going to happen is you, our opinions will be formed in other places, mm -hmm. and they may not be in line with the way of Jesus. And again, and again it's, I'm, not, I'm not talking about even one person. I'm talking about... The, the options of, offered to us. Anyways. I promise, Becky, we're coming to you in 30 seconds. I'm going to say it. I keep saying it every week. The, the thing that the church should be committed to, and this is what we're committed to, is always bringing about the what of the kingdom. So we can all agree on the what. And when we see the what of the kingdom not being carried out by the church, we confront it. 
where the world, where our country is so divided right now, isn't so much on the what, it's about the how. And so we want to be able to call things what they are. And we do want to give room for the how, right? And, and, and leave room for Christian conviction. If we all agree on the what, right, that, that, the, that the poor should be cared for, that the sick should be healed, that the, that the least of these should be honored, that we should, all, if we can agree on the what, then, then we can do this with the how, and we can kind of, you know, but we cannot compromise the what. The gospel, the, the scriptures are clear about the what. And so when we don't see the church, especially in America, what Mark just brought out this morning, the, the, the tidal shift in the white evangelical church has compromised the what on so many levels. And that's what's being called out. Yeah, it's, it's not it's, the how. It's the values. The yes. Core, the core values. Because, you know, the word unity gets tossed around a lot. You need something to unify around. Yes. Otherwise, it's an empty, false phrase. Yeah. And I want, I want to unify around the values of Jesus. If there's anything I'm going to put my flag on the ground and, and, and <laughs> take heat for, um, I want it to be on the values of Jesus. Anything else, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the what, I don't know. Yeah. We're, I, we're, I got ideas, I'm probably wrong. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. the what, the values yeah, of Jesus. Left, okay. Becky, 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 Joff, and Jim. Becky. Be the bridge. Okay. And then you mentioned about you can do the what. I want to say that just because you're white doesn't mean you're not called to be the bridge. All three of us. And so I don't want. I agree with that. You sure you don't want me to stop being a pastor after today? Thanks, Becky. For the folks online, Becky's singing our praise even after she <laughs> hates us this morning. For, for no, and and I want to say, and Becky's saying, you know, hey, just because you're not, just because you're white doesn't give you, you know, the right to be the pastors, and we appreciate that, and we we, we hear that, Becky. Uh, we do think that we need perspective at the decision making table as leaders, and we want that perspective that isn't ours, and so we're committed to that. Um, and in the same breath. Um, there's nobody, honestly, there's not an, a singular name or person I'm more proud of in the season than you, Becky. Yeah. Um, for, for you, you have had every opportunity to go find a choir that's singing a tune that you want to hear. Hmm. And you haven't. And you have grown exponentially um, because you care about being a Jesus person, a Jesus follower. More than you care. And you're pretty passionate <laughs> about your political and your national issues. And that's, that's great. Um, and I just want to just in front of everybody here and online, um, if there's anybody that's wrestled more, um, and, and seen it through, it's been you, Becky. And I just want to say that in front of folks, we're just so grateful and proud that we can do without you. We can't do this without folks like you to say, I'm uncomfortable. I don't agree with you to come up and shake your finger at a pastor after church. Like that's church. That's, that's family. 
Um, and so I'm just grateful for you, Becky. Yeah, I wanted to say that quick. Like, I love you, Becky. We love you. And I am inspired <laughs> by the fact that you were praying during this and that you decided to stay. Um, you know, how tables been turned, I might have got up and left. <laughs> like, like, heck no, I don't want to listen to this. Um, you, that's, that's what this is about. It's you saying, because I know your heart, I know you care so much about people. You're one of the most loving people I've ever met, and you care so deeply about Jesus. You're willing to sit in it and, and, and say, God, I, I don't know, do something. And that's what I'm trying to do, too. That's what we're all trying to do. Like, yeah. God, let us not run when it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, do a work in us. Yeah. I've been learning that more than ever in the past year of how often uh, I run when it gets uncomfortable. Worship team, we wrote a song <laughs> called Lead Me to Stay. Yeah. Paradoxical word because for me, so easy to run when it's uncomfortable. Whatever the situation, relationship, yeah. church, anything. And then you miss out on what God's trying to do. So thank you for being an example of what it looks like yeah. to pursue Jesus uh, in a courageous way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, awesome. Jeff? Yeah, why has the church as a whole, like the American church, why has it been difficult for the whole church to find the proper journey, speak out against it? I know there's a, you know, being Biden on the other side as well, but specifically out of like what happened over the past couple of weeks, and just following a lot of the big churches out there, why do you think churches have chosen to be silent on covered dreams and what it stands for? Mm. And I, I surely kind of explained, answered that kind of question, but Derek, I wanted to like hear your thoughts of like the silence of this. How are you just afraid of like hurting the church? Sure. So, Joff, for the folks at home, asked, why has it been so hard for the, the we'll call it the WEC, the white evangelical church, uh, to stand against Trumpism? Is that the question? Um, I think Mark preached about it brilliantly this morning. We, we gave up our birthright for a bowl of soup, right? We gave up, I mean, I think, I mean, what Mark touched on and, and hopefully started to excavate inside of us is, is all of those things, right? Um, I, I heard John Mark Comer say it. Um, I listened to a podcast the other day, and he talked about um, the 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 danger of ideology. And he said the, the problem with ideology is that it only looks at the ideals, right? So ideo ideology and idealism are connected. And you take all of the great things about something and you leave out all the bad things. And then that ideology that's rooted in idealism gets turned into idolatry. And, and I think that that is probably at the root of what the white evangelical, the stance the white evangelical church has taken is we've taken a couple key issues and we've said, hey, this is an ideological, an ideal world that's created an ideology that becomes idolism. When in, in, and then he says it in the podcast, he says, any time that happens, no matter what it is, it will always result in violence because the root of it is sin. And, and so we, and we've seen that play out. And I just thought that was a really profound way to look at it. And so I would just, my simple answer is um, ideology is, is probably um, the root thing. And the other side is not free from that as well. So I just want that to be said too. But that's my kind of first thought. Um, but honestly, I think Mark's message, I mean, really spoke to it. The bowl of soup, insert blank, whatever that bowl of soup is, man, I, I'm, I'm hungry, it's hot, it looks delicious, I want it now, versus something that's bigger and greater. Yeah, I, th I think, oh. I want, to, I want to hear from Mark, but I just want to give you just a human pastoral response to that question because it is costly. So why don't pastors step into it? Because it costs a tremendous amount. The amount of DMs and conversations, and it costs us. It costs us time with our families. It costs us time with our kids. It's exhausting. 
And so sometimes it's just self-preservation, to be honest, why people don't step into it. We're, we're humans. I know it's so easy to go, the church, and the church usually translates its way to the pastor should say something about it. Um, and it's, it's God-forsaken exhausting. Um, and so it's just easier, right or wrong. And I, I, I don't, um, I think the church needs to do a better job, but I also understand why many don't. Um, and that's not a pat on our back at all, because we, we, we certainly don't lean in in all of the ways and times we should or we feel compelled by the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes it's like, dude, I just literally, it's like bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. Like, you know, it's like, and so that's just an honest, like, human response. Um, yeah, I don't, ha- that's great. I don't have much more to add other than quickly. I don't know. I mean, we can't say for certain why anyone does or doesn't do something. Uh, I think it's a great question. But yeah, I think in so many arenas, over not just the American church, but over history as humans, it's so easy to gravitate to what's comfortable. We forget the church was born as this underground radical revolutionary movement that was trying to let people know that they all were valued and loved and that there was a savior who was bringing about a kingdom and there was forgiveness of sins and all this, the gospel. It's so easy for that, for us to get comfortable and whatever we we start to, our God becomes our appetite, as scripture says. And what is safe and what protects that comfort, fill in the blank, anything that might disrupt that is costly. In this particular scenario, this is the thing that's costly for a lot of pastors and churches. It's uncomfortable for me to be up here and um, I'll probably feel uncomfortable about it for a long time. Um, probably won't sleep tonight, but who knows? Um, anyways, that's it. And I think, but again, Jesus, count the cost. Every time a crowd would form around him, he'd say something crazy and 90% would leave. The crowd would build up again because he was doing miracles and he was making them feel good. He was saying stuff they loved, preaching to the choir. He'd say something crazy and they all leave again. And he's like, do you actually want to follow me? Because it's going to cost you. But... As I was saying at the beginning, what you get in return is infinitely better than what you left behind. It is is an investment, so to speak, because the cost, me me wrestling personally, I wrestle with defining my value by what people think of me. Letting that go, (laughs) there's something so much better in return. And fill in the blank for all of us. So that, I think, I would challenge that for any pastor, not just this question, but in anything, what are the things that we're afraid of? to lose when God's saying, that's the bowl of soup, the birthright's better. And in our own personal lives, what are the things that we're afraid to let go of because it's comfortable when God's calling us to something bigger? That's Jesus.